Sean King joins us now. Uh, great to have you, Sean. Hey, man. Good to have you, man. Good to talk to you all. Um, all right, Sean, um, as you look at this uh, Trump inauguration today, uh, what's your takeaways? Well, I, I definitely wouldn't call them festivities. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I, I did, against my own better judgment, uh, watch his inauguration speech. I, and, you know, there's this thing that I do see a lot of liberals and progressives say that I disagree with, and, and they say, ignore him. And I understand the spirit of what they mean by that. Ignore his tweets, ignore his speeches, or ignore him altogether. But I really don't think we can afford to ignore him. He's not a candidate now. He's not the president-elect. He is the president of the United States. What he says matters. It affects the world. It affects us. And so as much as I loathe Donald Trump, I feel the burden to, to listen to what he says, to study his moves, to study his team, and uh, I, I thought we got a lot of BS like we normally do from him today. Like he, he spent most, most of his inauguration speech uh, railing against the establishment, but he is the establishment. Like he talked about uh, his beef with seeing jobs shipped overseas, but he has shipped jobs overseas. And so, you know, he talked over and over again about um, how he'll basically be the president that will fight for everyday working people. But we're talking about a 70-year-old man, Gene, who has never done that his entire life. And so um, the speech, I thought, was fairly well written, but it, it, in essence, would require Donald Trump to reinvent himself to do the very things he said he was going to do as president. So... As a progressive, you know, I've got mixed feelings about uh, President Obama, as, as a lot of us do. Uh, sure. But as you saw him leaving in that helicopter, I'm, I'm curious what uh, you, what thoughts or feelings that you had. And man, it's painful, you know. And, and just like you, I'm, I've, I've been a constant critic of President Obama, and I, I felt like all of us should have done more of that. But you know, I wrote a piece recently where I was saying. There was a certain level of honesty. You felt like President Obama said what he meant, and he meant what he said. There was a certain level of decency there. And for me, less than it just pains me to see our first black president leave, it pains me to know that the level of honesty and integrity and decency, personal morality even, that that level is leaving. And um, I, I, I don't trust Donald Trump. I don't trust... Uh, his chief strategist, uh, Steve Bannon. I mean, uh, these aren't good guys. And I think most people would say, politics aside, that President Obama and Michelle Obama were good, quality, decent people. And we could disagree with them on policy every day, all day. But now we're talking about something altogether different, man. Yeah, you know, it, it, Michael Tracy, who we just hired today, uh, wrote a really interesting piece about Obama after he commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence. And I, and I thought it really resonated with me. He said, look, um, the Manning commutation showed that Obama has that moral core that we thought and hoped he had, right? Oh. Uh, that he could have left him there for 35 years, but he chose not to. He and, and by the way, it was against conventional wisdom, against the establishment, against the, what the Defense Department wanted, uh, what the military wanted, and it, and, it was, and it was a little bit bold. Now he said, look, as we all think, Chelsea Manning shouldn't have been there in the first place, Obama administration shouldn't have prosecuted him as, as hard as they did, and, and it doesn't mean that the drone strikes and all that didn't happen. Uh, and, and when you see the drone strikes and the content, uh, you know, we're still in the middle of a war in Iraq and Syria, he said it seems like he subordinated his moral core to get along in the system, but at least it exists. Uh, whereas with Trump, now this is me talking, Michael was just only writing about Obama. With Trump, I don't see that there's any core other than self-interest. And I don't know if we were just progressives talking to one another, you know, putting him down because, because we disagree with him. But the weight of the evidence with Trump University and every other thing, Trump Foundation, every other thing he's ever done, his administration picks, it appears that the central spoke of his, of his character is one of what's in it for me. 
And can you imagine a worse role uh, or a worse character trait for a person who has the role of looking out for all of us? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you all the way, man. I wrote a, an article this morning saying this was like one of the dumbest days in American history where if you look at any textbook definition of what is a president supposed to be like, what are the traits of a president, what are the qualities you want in a president, Donald Trump does not have those. Like the base, and this isn't us being partisan. Like PolitiFact has examined, you know, almost 400 statements he's made over the past two years, and defined him as the most dishonest politician they've ever evaluated. And so when you, when you look at honesty, when you look at integrity, like you said, with uh, with Trump University or his foundation, all which kind of you know went down in flames because of just basic issues of how they treated people, how they defrauded people out of their money or violated very basic rules. The way I talked about George Bush when he was president, it's very different than the way I feel about Donald Trump. I had major beef with policies and, and with issues of war and, and terrorism, but it, it generally got down to policy with George Bush, with Donald Trump. It's personal, like the man lacks the basic personal integrity and decency, and as you said, kind of the moral core. And, and so when we look at, uh, and like try to prognosticate and figure out what he's going to be doing, not just next year, but next week or next month, he's hard to pin down because he's lacked so much integrity for the, the entire span of his adult life. And we're talking about a 70-year-old man. I mean, he has a significant body of work for us to evaluate. And there's very little decency there. And I think that's what's causing a lot of people just to be scared to death. I mean, as I travel the country, at almost every event, I spoke in seven states last week, at almost every event I had somebody come up to me, including grown men, like regular, mentally well, emotionally stable grown men in tears because they are so perplexed, not only that he was elected, but at what he stands for and what it might mean for our country. And uh, I've never seen anything like it. And so I'm, I'm disturbed, man. Yeah, and, um, and we're not just saying it because we disagree with him. Look, I can go through dozens of cases of, of evidence where uh, they, he just looks out for himself. Like, look, hey, I'll give you one of dozens, right? When the, the Polish workers that he used, they were undocumented, and he used them to build one of his towers uh, because he could pay them less. And so when he claims to care about the American workers, we know it's it's not it's not we're not guessing. We know he already did it. You talk about the 70 years of his life. That's what he did in his life. He did it on a regular basis. In that case it happened to be Polish workers. And then when he got caught uh, with his hand in the cookie jar, then he just threw them away. He fired right. them all and and didn't blink. So whatever happened to those guys who knows? And this is well documented, and it's in the New it was in the New York Press at the time. They called him a Polish Brigade, and and so everyone seems disposable to him. It's only a matter of are you helping Trump at this moment, or are you not helping Trump? Yeah. If that's your only view of the world, and your whole job is to take care of other people, whew, sure. buckle up, buckle up. So, Sean, let's do an exercise we haven't done before. I'm curious on what your take on it is. Um, what do we think? And it's not necessarily. No, it's definitely a hard question. What do we think is the biggest thing that Trump will damage in the next four years? Like, so I suspect that there will be a lot of messes. It'll be foreign policy messes, domestic policy, et cetera. But what are you most concerned about? What are you worried that, that he's going to break that we might not be able to fix? Yeah, yeah. I'm, man, there's so much there. You know, I, I was talking with some close friends recently about that same idea of saying, what do we? What can we imagine the most destructive thing that he could possibly do? Even to back up just a little bit, I, I mentioned him earlier, but you know the chief strategist of the White House is Stephen Bannon, and I, I don't even think I've ever said this about anybody before, other than him. He is he is a genuinely terrible human being, <laughs> and every stop of his life, people say that very thing from his previous spouses, to, to his children, to his colleagues and co-workers and people he supervised. He's a generally terrible person. 
and he's demonstrated this over the course of decades. And so to have him as Donald Trump's chief strategist concerns me deeply. Like, we're not talking about a man who a long time ago used to be somebody totally different. We're talking about someone a few months ago was saying and doing destructive and terrible things as the leader of Breitbart. And so to have Breitbart's leader as the chief strategist concerns me deeply and puts me in a position where I, I feel like we have no idea what they could do. But Trump said something uh, today that did alarm me a bit in, in his speech when he talked about basically the complete eradication of Muslim extremists all around the world. I, I wonder what his plan is for that. I mean, immediately we think about, well, what will Trump do with immigration? And because he's, he said that he would uh, forcefully deport uh, 12 million undocumented immigrants in 24 months, which would be 450,000 people a month, which is, which is absurd and maybe even unrealistic. But if he delivered on that, it would be wild. I go back to war again. Um, you know, Republicans have a bent uh, toward war. And even though Donald Trump has made some allusions to what he would do in Iraq or what he would do in Afghanistan, one of the comments that he made today about, you know, eradicating extreme Muslim extremism around the world um, just made me wonder, what are they planning for war? And the notion of Donald Trump being our president, a wartime president, concerns me deeply. I mean, uh, the interviews that he did last week with papers in Germany and the UK, um, I, I, I say this, uh, any college student with one or two classes in international relations would have sounded so much more intelligent than he sounded in those interviews. Like, it, it was a man who, who appeared to not know what he was talking about. And um, but we see that with all of his cabinet picks, I mean, just consistently seeing them stumped by senators on very basic questions. So yeah. I'm concerned what that means for, for war around the world, not just in Iraq, but how will they pursue that? Yeah. Uh, will, they, will, will we have new wars here over these next few years? Uh, you can't put that past them. Even Republicans and conservatives have used wars to try to revitalize the economy even. Yeah. And so... We'll Sean, see. Sean, there's a real reason why it appears that uh, he uh, seems like he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. And he's uh, the the thing that this he he shares with Bush, and and it drove me crazy with Bush. I agree with you that in a lot of ways he's worse than Bush. It appears that he's based on his track record so far is worse than Bush. Now, of course, what he does in office is the most relevant. So we'll judge sure. him on that after he acts. But. Um, but he, what he shares with Bush is a lack of curiosity. So, hey, I, I don't know this thing about foreign policy, but boy, I'm president. I, I should probably find out. No, he doesn't bother finding out. And, yeah. and, and that's super scary. And the issue of war, a lot of people are going to lose their lives. And you want to talk about not reversible, a thing you break that you can't unbreak. Well, that's human lives. So you're absolutely right on that. On the other hand, if you look at it only from a political prism, and I would urge people not to just do that, but looking at it from just that facet for a second, um, he's put himself in an unwinnable situation on uh, fundamentalist Islam and war and all that. Because he said that he would not get involved in the mess in the Middle East, and he said well, he would wipe out ISIS on day one. Yeah. How in the world is he going to do that? Well, of course he can't wipe out ISIS on day one. And if he doesn't get involved, I don't know, you know, and, and his base wants, you know, destruction, etc. So, but the more he does that, the more he gets entangled in the middle of the Middle East and creates a bigger mess. So he's put himself, I believe, in a no-win situation. So, uh, you know, so that's the political lens. Me, what, what I'm most worried about, I think, is if he breaks democracy. And so I, I know right now it seems unthinkable. But I am worried that once he gets unpopular enough that he will go after his political opponents, not just on Twitter and not just w rhetorically, but I, that he will jail his political opponents. Now, he won't just say, hey, you know, John Iderola is uh, running against me or I don't like him and he's from the Democratic Party, I'm going to put him in jail. He'll make up an excuse, right? A danger to the republic when we're in the middle of this war that I started with whomever, right? We can't have these people betraying our country, and so it's important to the national cause to put them in jail. 
if you start doing that, well, yeah. and you yeah. break democracy, I don't know how we put that one back together. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And, and, you know, there's a part of me that even tries to put that out of mind, even for myself, you know, like I, you know, even part of my concern with Steve Bannon is when he was at Breitbart, he attacked me consistently. And so we, we have no idea how Trump, with the power of the Oval Office, you know, you know, now that he will oversee the Justice Department and the FBI and the CIA and the military, Secret Service, how will he use those to attack journalists, to attack political opponents? Uh, will we be going back to the days of, uh, of, an, of an FBI like the one that J. Edgar Hoover led? And um, I think we have to be extremely vigilant. And I think, you know, people want us to, uh, want, want to pigeonhole us as being like alarmists. But that's not really the arc of my life. I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not an alarmist. I think we get back to what we're talking about. It's all we can do is look at the the themes of his life and his integrity and moral character over the course of his life. Or, or if we just look at the campaign and the way he, the way he spoke and the way he handled the campaign, if he just acts like that as president, it's going to be deeply problematic. And um, I'm very concerned. Uh, you know, I, I think you raise an essential issue. And, and people will say, well, break democracy. Isn't that ridiculous? I feel like we're closer to that than I've ever felt in my life. And um, I'm yeah. deeply disturbed by it for sure. And, you know, look, it's it's small now. It was just personal attacks. But if it gets more political and, and he's in more trouble, I don't know how much worse it gets. And, you know, we're by we're nowhere near the the top issue or the top of their list, but but you and I have both been attacked by the alt right and and the Breitbart's of the world and and the Roger Stones of the world, et cetera. Whether it was you know Stone and Jones coming on our set, and and then they you know there's the substantive attacks if anything they do is substantive, and then they attack people for who they are, you know, and with absurd things like they're like, okay, you're you got attacked for being white, I got attacked for being brown. <laughs> like, what is that? I don't even know what that is, right? Why is that even an attack? It, w it would be, it would, we could, we could dismiss it as being ridiculous if they didn't now have such open access to Donald Trump himself. And that's what disturbs me is, again, like, we're not talking about a mainstream politician and there being, and the alt-right being outside of the White House. With Steve Bannon in the White House, the alt-right is in the White House. I mean, he, he's there. I mean, he is, in essence, Trump's... I mean, Trump hired Steve Bannon as the CEO of his campaign, and the first person that he hired was Steve Bannon to be his chief strategist. And so uh, it would seem preposterous to think that the worst elements of society would influence the president, but when you have Steve Bannon as chief strategist, I mean, we're not being absurd. And so, and, and, and but we know that Donald Trump has a deep history of being vindictive. Uh, revenge is, if anything, revenge is a theme of his life. He, uh, he has even said it, that, uh, that he hold. I mean, in his own mouth, he talks about how he holds grudges for his entire life until he gets payback. And so, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, are concerned because Experiencing him as a candidate, experiencing him as the president-elect is one thing, but we're in a very different position. I think most of the fear is based on something that I see in horror movies. You know, when you watch a horror movie, the scariest part is not when the monster jumps out. The scariest part is when the monster's around the corner or when there's a dark room and you don't know what's there. I think what has people freaking out with Trump right now is we just don't know what he's going to do, good, bad, or ugly. And, um, you know, I, I think that's... Bernie, Bernie has taken... Bernie Sanders has taken a really complicated stance that pissed a lot of people off because Bernie said, hey, if Trump does anything of substance that's quality or good or has quality proposals, I want to hear them and see how we can make them happen. And I understand what Bernie's talking about because... Bernie's job is to represent and look out for the people. And so Bernie's taking one stance of saying, like, hey, if there's any way we can extract any good from this presidency, he's going to do it. And then there are others of us who say, no, 
I'm going to oppose Donald Trump every chance I get. And so, uh, but, but a lot of it is none of us, not me, not you, not Bernie or any of us really know where this thing is about to go. Yep. Sean, we're going to leave it right there. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we yep. appreciate it. Sean King from uh, New York Daily News and, of course, now one of the hosts of Young Turks. Uh, thank you for the coverage. We appreciate it. Always, man. Take care. All right, you too.